Hi, everyone. I hope everyone had a, a good lunch and enjoyed the wonderful uh, film and discussion that followed. Uh, we're ready to begin our next panel. The panel is titled United Fronteras, Borderland Identities in the Future of Digital Cultures. Um, and we have four presenters. Two of them are going to be on Zoom. <laughs> Um, the first two presenters are going to be um, virtually here. It will be Mayra Alvarez and Laura Gonzalez. Mayra Alvarez, PhD candidate in the University of Houston, and Laura Gonzalez, assistant professor at the University of Florida. And then we will follow with Annette Zapata, a PhD candidate, University of Houston. And then the fourth speaker will be Silvia Fernandez, PhD candidate at the University of Houston as well. So let's welcome them. Um, so, hello everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, so, before we start, I would like to invite you to use the hashtags for DH Forum 19, but also for Borderlands DH and United Fronteras uh, in order to follow us in social media. And also, I would like just to make an announcement that we have another uh, colleague of ours that is part of the team of United Fronteras presenting as well, uh, but at another conference in Monterrey, Mexico. So we're very happy to, to be um, presenting the project in different uh, countries in this instance and also in diff uh, by different uh, colleagues. So, uh, Annette, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, my presentation is going to be a general overview of the project, and uh, I titled this Building Bridges, Uniendo Fronteras, um, because that's the idea, the general idea of United Fronteras. Um, next slide. Thank you. And before I begin um, with the presentation United Fronteras, I would like to, uh, to begin with this uh, quote by Gloria Saldua, a fronteriza or border native. And uh, she refers to facultad in Borderlands La Frontera as the capacity to see the surface phenomenon, the, meaning, uh, the meaningful deeper realities to see the deep structure below the surface. And in other words, what she's referring to is that um, our personal experiences or struggles and knowledge allow us to see beyond what it is in the surface surface to um, see the deeper realities, and in this case, the borderlands between the U.S. and Mexico. And therefore, with our facultad or knowledge uh, was essential in the creation of United Fronteras, since it helped us to contest the toxic rhetoric against U.S.-Mexico borderlands and enables to uh, create alternative perspectives um, in regards to, to this region. So what is, oh, can we go to the next one? So what is United Fronteras? Well, it's a collaborative, non-institutional and non-funded project that uses minimal computing and geospatial tools to visualize projects um, produced within the borderland that enables to engage the multiple dimensional layers of border spaces through multiple dis disciplinary, institutional, community-based, and individual collaborations. LADA will be, um, talking about the collaborative models in a moment, and Annette and Sylvia will be addressing the critical work in local praxis, praxis held in, the complex, in this complex region. So just briefly, uh, in terms of minimal computing, uh, we are, uh, in regards to United Fronteras, the website was done to JCOP, and it's hosted in GitHub. So, this is uh, with the idea of sustainability. And, um, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit more in terms of the, of the map that is being, uh, currently we're working on that. But uh, the idea is that, that as a collaborative um, project, all of us are bringing our skills, our knowledge into the creation, the whole creation of it. Um, and thus the non-institutional idea of it as well. So, can we go to the next? Thank you. 
Um, before I begin also uh, to explain a bit more on the project, it has two phases. I'm going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be talking about the first phase, which is the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. And this is important in order to understand uh, what borderlands are we talking about for this uh, first phase of the project. Uh, next slide. So in terms of borderlands, uh, we're talking about the territories that were part of the Spanish borderlands during the 19th century, but also of the 20th and 21st century border cities and counties. And this is the border that we are familiar with uh, right now, uh, that division line that was established in 1848. So for those who are not familiar with uh, the history of the territory of the borderlands, uh, in the next slide, uh, there's a map where, next slide. So this is a map of what, we're, what the borderlands we are talking about um, uh, looks like or re we're referring to. So here we have the, um, the territory when it became Mexican territory, when it got it, Mexico got it, it's independent. So it's not just the division line that we're talking about. It's all this territory. Projects are talking about the space or uh, are being um, produced within space, within the space. So it's not limited, again, to the current division line. And in terms of visualization for the map for United Fronteras, it's to bring to the forefront the neglected dynamics and the junctions of complex identities uh, arising in, from the shifting of political geopolitical borders between Mexico and the United States since colonial times. So it's going to allow us, all those projects are, are going to allow us to engage with, with, uh, with the history and the identities and uh, the political and social uh, aspects of this region. Next slide. So uh, in terms of digital map, it is important to understand that it's not just mapping projects, but the power that it has in order to, to present uh, a project like this. So according to Anita Lichesi, it's the power mapping is that there's so much um, power in it that it's not necessarily has to be oppressed because we know that maps are a colonial product and it can be liberating can be healing and it can empower, especially when it's used by people who have been historically oppressed, like in the case of the borderlands. Next slide. So here is a glimpse of what uh, we're working on right now in terms of um, United Fronteras map, how the projects are going to be mapped. So first of all, it's inverted because it's, again, putting everything on its head. Right, um, by beginning to just question what are we looking at, the territory, the space itself, and then going into that space through the multiple uh, projects that we're gonna be uh, looking at in a moment. So, and also you also are gonna see lines and the brown areas are the representation of mountains. The lines are representation of rivers because uh, one of the, the things that we talk about is how we're going to approach the space, like how we're going to be mapping the projects. So we thought about, you know, the, the, the term in terms of the ecological aspect of the border region or the borderlands. And so the, the rivers, the streams, all of that is going to be connecting each project. And uh, again, it's just layers upon layers questioning and, and trying to engage with, with, uh, with the U.S. borderlands from various perspectives uh, as to how it's going to be mapped, how it's conceived, and how it's going to be engaging. All the projects are going to be uh, talking to each other as well and in order to question and challenge uh, the, the, the current um, discourse and past discourse. So it's going to allow us to have various perspectives in terms of geography, historically, politically, socially, and culturally. So let I'm going to pass the word uh, the the word to uh, Laura, who's going to be talking a bit more about collaboration.
Can everybody hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you for allowing us to engage with the presentation in this way. Uh, my name is Laura Gonzalez. I'm an assistant professor um, in the English department at the University of Florida. I was formerly at the University of Texas at El Paso on the um, Mexico-US border, um, and that's how I became involved and continue to be involved with this amazing team and on this project. Um, and so I'm interested in frameworks for creating collaborative projects through participatory design and by leveraging our language a um, assets. So a lot of times we think about bilingual or multilingual projects as projects that present us with challenges. So um, the idea that we have to do translations to make things accessible. And I'm interested in um, kind of flipping that a little bit and thinking about translation as a framework for participatory design that allows our work to be accessible to broader audiences. And that's what one of the things that's been really interesting to me about working on this team. Um, we can go to the next slide. So I wanted to start with just some definitions. Um, so human-centered design, so I think this project, um, we're approaching it through both a human-centered and a participatory um, design model. Uh, Human-centered design is the idea that uh, designers create things with humans in mind. So not necessarily that we um, need to adapt human behavior to better fit with technologies, but rather that technologies need to be designed to fit within the activities that humans are already engaging in. So human-centered design um, was developed in the, in the U.S. Um, with the idea that technology should be usable by many people. But participatory design, we can go to the next slide. Participatory design, on the other hand, moves away from an idea that we need to design things for people to we need to design things with people, with the users, and with the communities that we're um, trying to engage with. So United Fronteras kind of blends user-centered design, human-centered design, and participatory design because we want to design something for a community, but also with a community. And so our team, we can go to the next slide. I just pulled this from... Um, the part of our website that describes our team, um, which compo is composed of digital humanities scholars from various disciplines and universities, mostly women, um, border natives, or people who have a connection to the border um, with, for, through our particular experiences. So we are the designers and the users, but we're also part of this community. And I think that's really important because I think it gives us an important lens and a valuable lens through which we can create this project and also bring other people in the pro into the project as well. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, um, so like I mentioned in the link to the team is on our website. So I didn't wanna go through every single person because everyone's getting introduced. But in general, um, the team is interdisciplinary and cross-institutional, considers lived experience as expertise that can influence the design process. Um, and the collaboration and participatory aspect is not just at the beginning, like at the conceptualization of the project, but in every stage of the process, it's collaborative and participatory. So we all act as both designers, but as user testers. Because we're part of that community, we can test the project with each other and make recommendations as people who know what it takes to design something that's usable and as people who um, are in the community, this will be used. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. Within all of this, um, I'm really interested in looking at the the value that language and language diversity brings to participatory design. And so it's interesting to know and important to know that all elements of the project um, are bilingual in Spanish and English. And, you know, this can tie into many conversations about language diversity on the border, which means that we all identify as bilingual um, Spanish and English speakers to various degrees, but we all have different strengths and weaknesses within our language. And so it's interesting, it has been interesting for me to kind of see how all of us incorporate our language strengths throughout different parts of the project. So for example, if we go to the next slide, this is just a screenshot of um, part of the database where we are listing different projects. And it's interesting to note that we provide, so we um, develop this database where we have descriptions of different borderland projects. Some of those are first written in English, some of them are first written in Spanish. 
and not every member of the team necessarily feels comfortable doing the translation. So sometimes one person will write the description in English and then somebody else will assign themselves to do the translation and then other people will review <laughs> and kind of user test the translation. So in this sense, um, translation and the negotiation of language becomes part of the participatory design of the project itself because just like now one person needs to have all the tech skills to create a digital humanities project not every person on the team needs to have all the language skills to create a bilingual project the idea is embracing a model that allows us to leverage those assets so that different people on the team are leveraging their skills and making contributions based on what they feel comfortable with while also seeing um, how their skills can be contributed can contribute to something that's usable for more people so in this case, translation is not necessarily a challenge that will impede the project from proceeding, but it's actually an affordance that allows us to reach more people on both sides of the border. Um, we can go to the next slide. So just to kind of sum up, I think what we're practicing as a team um, is a notion of participatory translation, where every element of the project is created bilingually at different stages. So it's not just a, tra a literal translation where everything is first in English and then translated to Spanish, but it's really a co-creation of information in both languages at the same time, drawing on the language and cultural skills of all the members. Um, so even though we all have different strengths and weaknesses when it comes to our language skills, we can um, contribute our skills to the project. And it actually reflects borderland, uh, borderland language because on the border, um, there are many different Spanishes and Englishes that are used every day. Um, and one last thing I wanted to note is that translation extends beyond the alphabetic to also incorporate visual design. So our notions of translation help us also provide feedback to visuals, um, ranging on everything from the logo for the team to the actual design of the interface. Um, we wanna create something that is accessible and usable to both Spanish and English speakers. And so we needed to think about translation, not just in the alphabetic description of the project, but also in the visual design and how that may or may not resonate with um, people who identify with heritage languages that are different. Um, I think, I think that's the, yeah, so that's it. Thank you so much. All right, so I am going to continue um, with my presentation, Community Digital Activism, Countering Mainstream Narratives on the Texas-Mexico Border. Okay, um, so um, my presentation focuses on three projects from the Texas-Mexico border that approach DH from community activism. These particular projects drew my attention um, while working on United Fronteras because two of them are uh, representative of my community and upbringing, and the third is part of a larger conversation being had in the U.S. on immigration, asylum, and family separation. As a border native from the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas, these projects bring forth post-colonial representations of what it is to be from the border. So I begin with highlighting the mainstream narrative that we are accustomed to hearing about the border region with this quote from Gloria Anzaldúa. I quote, gringos in the US Southwest consider the inhabitants of the borderlands transgressors, aliens. Do not enter, trespassers will be raped, maimed, strangled, gassed, shot. The only legitimate inhabitants are those in power, the whites, and those who align themselves with whites. Tension grips the inhabitants of the borderlands like a virus. Ambivalence and unrest reside there, and death is no stranger." End quote. These words, published in 1987, continue to resonate in my hometown and across the border region today. Headlines of mistreatment and violence against immigrants and Latino members of the border, uh, of the border are constant. When this is what we see in national media, it's easy to forget that border communities are more than violence, crime, death, and walls. The digital humanities projects that I am um, highlighting here are Uncaged Art from the University of El Paso's in Institute of Oral History, Poets Against, the Poets Against Walls Collective, 
and the um, website Neta. They are countering the national narrative through digital activism using platforms to visualize other stories. While these project, projects are producing and sharing their own knowledges, they are utilizing commercial platforms such as YouTube, Vimeo, and other materials such as blogs and social media that are not always considered digital humanities projects. As Rupika Rizam notes, quote, the framing of digital humanities public discourse has obscured their value for the digital cultural record, end quote. Nonetheless, these projects are intervening in the digital cultural record to tell new stories, shed light on counter histories, and create spaces for communities to produce and share their own knowledges should they wish by contesting the mainstream narratives while proposing a, border, a broader notion of DH. Rissam continues, post-colonial digital humanities scholarship includes a range of methods and practices in media, mapping, scholarly, scholarly communications, and cultural heritage that complicate the existing state of the digital cultural record, end quote. The three projects here complicate that state by providing a space for community voices through the use of journalism, poetry, oral history, and or testimony, allowing for participation in performances, the interviewing of community members on local issues, and informing the community about events, such as um, art exhibits and protests in the area. NETA uses a digital platform to, pro uh, to provide news about the community, events in the area, and cultural and political interviews, podcasts, and stories. Here, we see um, their page on um, LGBT and women's rights. So we see some of the articles that they have here on their website. And um, uh, we also see links to folklore uh, podcasts and immigration topics here on the side. Um, Poets Against Walls Collective performs poetry readings in different areas of the borders, of the border, and at events of solidarity for border residents and immigrate in immigrants, and gives access to them on their YouTube channel and through Facebook. And we can see some of the videos on their YouTube channel here. And UTEP's Institute of Oral History conducts and makes available interviews and their transcriptions and produce videos and podcasts. And here are a few of their projects, including the, their video on the Uncaged Art exhibit and project, um, an art installation comprised of donated art from the now closed Tornillo Child Detention Center. This type of digital activism represents re uh, resistance journalism, which is, quote, a type of citizen journalism that can be used to create a platform for marginalized voices to expose and dissent structures of oppression, dis de disseminate exper experiential knowledges of poverty, and mobilize activism as a way to invert the hierarchy of access and subvert the political power structure of dominant narratives." End quote. Additionally, these projects use social media platforms as Cindy Vincent and Sarah Straub describe, quote, to create a space for dissension, allowing the negotiation of political power and cultivating a, re a richer understanding of the power and potential of digital media technologies for democratization and unengaged citizenry. Not only are the creators of these projects sharing their knowledge, they're also engaging the community in political, cultural, and historical ways that are usually not included in mainstream media. This intention is made clear in their mission statements. So here up top, we see um, Neta's mission statement. And um, I will read this part. Our platform builds community power by amplifying valley narratives and perspectives, making sure we are heard in the media circus that surrounds border issues. Um, the Poets Against Walls Collective aims to tell, document, and share communal stories from individual perspectives through poetry, testimonio, and the spoken word about life here in La Frontera, stories, and or points of view the media often miss misses. 
and the Institute of Oral History in El Paso gathers, preserves, and disseminates the oral histories of people living in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. They do this by conducting interviews, making oral history audio recordings and transcripts available to researchers and the public, producing videos and podcasts, and promoting oral history through classes, workshops, publications, and internships. As Cherry Moraga notes, one of our oldest written traditions resides on the indigenous ground on the spoken word. Mexicans and Mex Mexicanas and Mexicanos have always told stories aloud as weapons against traiciones, as historical accounts and prophetic warnings, as preachers and teachers against wrongdoing, as songs of celebration, as exclamations of laughter, as prayer in the presence of the divine. And through this storytelling, one's awareness of the world and its meaning grows and changes, end quote. These projects use storytelling as a weapon to contest the monolithic narratives of the border and grow the community's awareness of the world to create change, solidarity, and consciousness at a local and global level. I leave you with this clip of Neta's video in which they share why their platform is necessary. While it's specific to their project, both Poets Against Walls and the Oral History Institute share similar objectives. The way these creators use DH is opening the path for communities to share their own stories. My name is One more minute. <laughs> we want to build a bilingual multimedia platform that challenges mainstream narratives about the Rio Grande Valley, the southernmost region along the Texas-Mexico border. Our platform will be online based and published videos, live broadcasts, podcasts, and articles. From culture to food, from music to politics, from LGBTQ issues to immigration news, we'll deliver authentic content and start a new era of media serving the community. In the Valley, we're proud of our unique borderline culture, the vibrant blend of Southern Texas and Northern Mexico. Our region relies on the support of more than one million people of color and immigrants, giving us the power to change our narrative. But mainstream media only talks about our border region in limited frameworks that mostly stick to stereotypes and stories that misrepresent who we are. Our identities are often filtered, edited for commercial and political purposes, or misrepresented on a national scale. Our geographical location on the Texas-Mexico border makes us an attractive target for dangerous politics. This has encouraged others to attempt to speak for us or presume to understand what is best for our region. We need a media platform that shifts narrative building power from mainstream media to community members. And I will cut it off there. Um, the video is very nice. It is on their website. Um, um, it is also found on YouTube if you would like to do more research on them. Thank you. I'm last. I'm not going to take too long because I know you are all tired. Thank you so much for making it till the end. <laughs> My colleagues just went over the different aspects and examples of how United Fronteras is a structure and the meaning of this project. I will end up the presentation by highlighting the importance of creating a borderlands cultural digital record through this project. Um, in, a tech, in a TED talk, the danger of a single story, Chimamana Adishi argues that inherent in the power of stories is a danger, the danger of only knowing one story about a group, a region. And I quote, the single story creates stereotypes and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but they are incomplete. They make one story became the only story. In post-colonial digital humanities, we found the possibility of creating the cultural digital record that traces, recompiles, and documents projects that represents the border or contains borderlands material. Through these post-colonial practices, 
it is possible to approach a decolonial thinking that introduces a critical border rethinking, which contributes to a shift in the forms of knowing in which the world is thought from the concrete incarnate experiences of colonial differences and the wounds left. These practices contribute to what Maria Lugones proposes on border thinking as an embedded, embodied consciousness in which dualities and vulnerabilities are central for a decolonization of how we think about the geo and body politics of borderlands knowledge. And I'm sure that you all know about or have you seen a project that talks about the borderlands, a podcast, a blog, but that's not that's part of the story, right? It doesn't reflect the whole complexity of this region. And it has its negative, it has its positives. So that's why it was the intention of this project to recompile all these projects and visualize what is the borderlands. In, in the first stage, we're talking about the US-Mexico borderlands. And as... <clears throat> In United Fronteras, it allows for multiple perspectives of knowing about the border region since pre-colonial times to the present, an important aspect to challenge the monolithic representation of the US-Mexico border. So why the necessity to trace, recompile, and document the cultural and digital record of the US-Mexico border? to bring to the forefront the various ways in which historical realities, past and present social political conditions, and local experiences of this region are being showcased, imagined, and explored. And we, found, and we follow what Rupika Rizams proposes as the digital cultural record. And we'll put um, in the project these perspectives as post-colonial, feminist, anti-racist, and intersectional. Therefore, the digital cultural record created brings multi multiple stories and complex histories that present the development and humanity of this region. <clears throat> um, as we accomplish this through a combination of theory, personal theory, which is our own experiences, as well as the, riches, the research ha that has been done all over um, of the United of the Borderlands analysis and praxis, we put the uh, we put in practice what we know about our personal experience and what we have uh, been taught, and that requires a collaborative environment of the construction of two databases that encompass an archive that documents the local practices, the cultural heritage, and the critical work of the U.S. Mexico Borderlands as well as a digital directory, exhibition, and map to visualize and make accessible this documentation in an act interactive way, which is part of what Rupika Rizam is proposing as post-colonial digital humanities. In this, um, in this slide, I'm showing you some of the projects that we have recompiled until now. It's a total of 117 projects. And I will go over the details about these projects. These images will um, be incorporated into a digital exhibit using minimal computing to present those. <coughs> um, in here, there's um, the two databases. The first database is um, documenting the project, what it consists of the project, the title, the link, the city state and the country, which means the material that it's being reflected in that project, the historical period, which is according to the history of this area, the genre, what digital companions and technologies are they using, and keywords that can help us to describe what the project is reflecting, as well as some certain information that they're using as email, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and the description. And as Laura mentioned, the description and all the information is being in Spanish and English. The other database is compiled about the creator's, inf uh, the creator's information. Who are them? Where are them from? Because that's really important for us of how they are constructing this project. 
and to document that because if the project disappears, that work also disappears. The person that were involved in there disappears. So that's part of the second database. Moving towards who are the creating who are creating the projects. We have um, seen that there's different cases. For example, um, there's one Coahuila that it's a governmental own project and they trace and they document the, 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 um, a lot of archives from that state. Torn Apart Separados, for example, it's not tied to an institution, but it's a group of scholars from across the nation. Ellas Tienen Nombre, it's a project of one individual that is from a border city that is mapping the feminicides in Ciudad Juarez. And another example, it's Border Studies Archive, which is hosted by the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. And there's other kind of examples. What is the status of the project? There are several projects that are active, right? Um, some of them are continuously being added a lot of information, but there's also the case of the ones that are inactive, which is the record that we're keeping. For example, Sultanita, the record on Google is just the image. If you go and click to it, it's inactive. Facebook also doesn't work for the website. Turista Fronterizo, we found a lot of pages that they have the descriptions of the projects, but once you go to the link, it, link it's not working. So it's also that work, right? The labor of recompiling what it's not in the in media, but it was a project that represented this region. The last um, aspect I want to include about the projects is what digital technologies companions are being used, which is challenging the idea of what is digital humanities. Because a lot of these projects, some of them describe themselves as digital humanities projects, but others don't even <laughs> think about that, but they're using digital technology. In one of them, for example, Load Roof, it's a, um, what's it called, what's the name of the a drone? that they make a video game of crossing the border. In Transported Immigrant Archive, they designated a tool for migrants to know where they can look for water. Phonoteca, it's, uh, they're recording the sounds of the border, and they have the exhibition about that. Another example that it's more traditional, it's a digital exhibit of newspapers from some certain areas of the border. So um, to finalize, we can see that the necessity to create and document the cultural and digital record of the Mexico-US borderlands that challenges the danger of the one story by bringing multiple stories to the forefront leading to a critical border rethinking. Additionally, the creation of a digital cultural record has a tremendous potential for continuing to shape the past, present, and future of borderlands and DH, and challenging the knowledge that scholars and public audience have about this region and field. And to end up, um, we would like to invite you to visit um, the website, learn more about the project, and stay tuned for the upcoming visualizations, which take time because of the issue that we are, that's a work aside from our responsibilities. We are working as a distance. But in the meantime, also, if you have any questions, any suggestions, any information that will help us to grow the project, and do it more approachable to the um, to the public. It will we will be very thankful. Here is some um, some of the information for you to keep on um, connected with the project. Thank you so much.
I have two questions. One has to do with, I noticed a lot of you are PhD candidates, and I was wondering if this project is a part of your dissertation research. And then the second element had to do with, if you're not, affili if you're not connected and housed in one university, how are you guys, c what methods are you using to connect or grow, or do you foresee as you move forward uh, that you might place yourself institutionally somewhere? Um, so, no, uh, we are not doing this as part of our dissertation. Um, some of us uh, do focus on the borderland region as part of our research. Um, others have participated in other DH projects that involve the borderlands, but um, we are not including that as part of our um, dissertation projects or anything like that. Um, yeah, well, to add to that, to add to that, it's particularly because we create, since we're not involved, our dissertation is not involving the project, we wanted to include people that can take advantage of this project and move forward to their careers. So if you can see the people that it's involving the project are from different fields, so they can study the project and they can present, create articles, um, expand on it on different perspectives in their own fields. So it's really open to that sense. In, the, in response to the question about the institution, we didn't um, host it in any institution because of, the, of our status, that we are PhD students, and if we host it in an institution, then it will be a, a property of the institution. And in the case that we're working in collaborative way, we want to also challenge that. How can projects that are funded by students, that are sustained by students, will have financial assistance, will apply for grants, and continue to expand them? Because as we move forward, we see that a lot, that students are creating their own projects. But what about the sustainability of them? So we're moving to, we're using, that's why we're using minimal computing in order to sustain that. It takes more time. And also, since everyone is from different universities, they can apply to scholarships. They can um, make their institutions participate in the project, but um, as part of each of the members of the project. That's how we're doing, and we always keep in constant communications to dialogue about those things that will benefit all the people that it's involved in the project. Um, and most of us are coming from humanities backgrounds. Um, there are a few that have a little bit more tech, uh, technological backgrounds, but so we're learning minimal computing and everything uh, from scratch, so that, uh, that's also part of that process, but it was the best way to uh, maintain that um, the ability to keep that project with us as a group um, and as we move forward in our careers. Hi, thank you very much for that great talk. I have a few comments and questions. I also come from El Paso, from Juarez. I went to UTIP, so I'm very glad to see my alma mater represented here. I'm very happy about that. But, you know, one of the things that I loved about growing up in Juarez in El Paso was the fact that there was actually no identity to who I was or who my people were, and it was really beautiful to grow up, let's say, in the 90s in Juarez, where, and, and in El Paso, uh, by not being subjected to the national identity of Mexico, national identity of the United States, so we're ni de aquí ni de allá, right? We were from neither place. And so I'm wondering whether there's a little bit of a paradox when we're now digitizing our region, Right, and we're sort of solidifying the the identity of the border creature, and now now we are creating a document in which, um, you know, for an identity that it didn't exist when I was growing up. At least it didn't exist in the psyche. Right, it was very liberating to not know what we were, and 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 it seems like it's a nice idea for an outsider to get a glimpse of who we are. But as an insider, I see it as like, oh wait. Are we becoming more monolithic the more we digitize what we deem to be our culture, right? El fronterizo. Yeah. Right. I think, well, I'm, I don't agree that much with your comment, particularly because we're including projects 
that bring the different identities of the border. So that's why we're including projects from both sides of the borderlands in order to document that. The ones that are being developed and how they represent in the Mexican side and what is happening in the Mexican side, the ones that have been there since before it was uh, a division line from the US side, but also that fluidity. Um, there are certain projects project that identity of Fronterizo that one in one moment they tell they're Mexicans, they cross and they're US citizens. So that's the intention of this project, to bring the different identities. And what we did, it's also including opening the projects so before pre-colonial times for that too. To bring the, the to bring the notion of that space before it was Mexico and the U.S. and that has been more complicated because that's why we included the historical periods in order to trace that also the movement of the different borderlands and there's projects that are working with that um, native lab native land is one of them but um, that was our intention to break that monolithic identity of the borderland and bring the different perspective of the borderland. And that's why we are also including projects from outside that they work with the borderlands in also to include that, how people see the borderlands from the outside. Um, also, uh, that's part of the reason why, as Mayra described, um, the map is not um, going to Rep, uh, represent those geopolitical borders. Um, it, we uh, the map we showed showed the um, the topographical aspect of it, not the geopolitical aspect. Um, so it shows a little bit more of that fluidity of the region and not the separation that we see when we look at a typical map nowadays. Thanks for this great talk. It's so exciting to see this project progress. Um, I wanted to ask a sort of a similar question, and I wanted to ask, you know, how you think about the surveillance aspects of the digital world, this idea that any data that goes onto the internet becomes, you know, the government's data and corporate data, right, even if that's not our intentions, and sort of how you how you're thinking about that and how you're reconciling that with the more um, decolonial project that you're trying to do. Yeah, thanks. So I, think, um, I think that's very important and that's why we also decided to work with material that it's already in the public, right? Um, based on my experience that we work with archives, we saw that notion of a lot of protection of the of newspapers that archives don't want to put to the public or expose them. And in this case, we decided to work with projects that are already out there, that we are not working on that idea of putting them into the digitized world, rather than just documenting what has been created. Because mostly of these projects are with that intention for people to use these resources. But since sometimes it's very local practice, it just stays in the region, or just people from the region use them, and we decided to incorporate them all together in order for people to know what is being produced in these areas and how it's being produced. So that's why um, we were really aware of surveillance that we decided just to include that. And um, coming from the border region, um, we're already uh, the hypersensitive to that surveillance, and um, these a lot of these projects are being uh, produced in the borderlands, not just about the borderlands. So um, I I am more than positive that um, that they're aware of this themselves, and if especially those who are working on um, an activist perspective, they're probably already on the radar because they're putting themselves out there online on public platforms like social media. 
Um, so really, like Sylvia said, we're just we are documenting what's already there. We're not um, uh, trying to uh, force anyone to go out into the open or anything like that. And just to share something, I think um, it's something important that historian Yolanda Leva from UTEP just mentioned weeks ago that the detention center from El Paso was shut down because of media, because people was um, distributing a lot of critiques about this center, and it was one of the major reasons that it was shut down. So I think it's very important to use these social platforms for, our, um, for the humanity of the world. I'm just wondering about if you could comment on two challenges a little bit. The first one is this border that starts expanding and someone doesn't really know what is to be necessarily in the borderlands considering that from a national surveillance perspective, we can consider Kansas to be borderlands in that way. So this idea that really the border is more and more mm, inland, how you compensate that the challenge of it just becoming something that is not anchored and grounded in the space of the borderlands. And the other thing is the scope of, make, of phase one and phase two. I actually do have a question with that because it seems like one large uh, challenge is just to approach the diversity of the borderlands between Mexico and the US itself. And the fact that, for instance, in Arizona, most of it is federal land and a lot of it is Native American land. So these are, I mean, is, if you could comment a little bit of those challenges, if, I mean, I can see the advantages of saying now we're starting here and then we're moving larger and larger and larger, but just addressing the incredible diversity based on the politics of each state seems something very relevant too. So if you could comment a little bit on that too, since a lot of it has been in the Rio Grande area. We're being guided by the production, right? So um, particularly in, on the Mexico, US-Mexico borderlands, there's a lot of production, right? But we have been including what is out there rather than just focusing on an area that we know that it's very broad. But if people hasn't created any projects from that area, we cannot be just concentrated in one area. So it's based on what it's out there to be included in it. In the second phase, that is um, the Central America area, the different borders, we have seen that there's less projects that are using digital components. So that's why we included different countries rather than just the Mexico and Belize. Instead, we incorporate all of that area in order to see how they are um, portraying, how they are documenting this area through with digital companions. So it was just more based on what is out there rather than, because we open it, we open it up to the region, but we depend, we rely on what is there and what we can find. Um. And if there are projects um, from Kansas or anywhere else that was at some point in history part of that border region, um, we do have a link on the website um, requesting um, contributions. Uh, so if you know of any DH projects that encompass those areas, um, the protocols are also on that website. And um, if, if those projects fall under those protocols, then we will be more than happy to add it into the database. Um, uh, to more recent projects um, that encompass more present day um, ideas of borderland, we uh, are currently looking at the border region, um, not uh, the geopolitical region, even though we erase that line, we're looking at the ones that are uh, that are targeted specifically in that area, not necessarily produced in that area, but about that area. Um, and for the next phase, we are trying to connect with um, scholars and uh, activists and community members from the Central American region so that they can help us navigate uh, uh, the, uh, that area. And um, since we are from, 
from the US-Mexico border region so that they can advise us on how to approach that phase as well, not, not with our border perspective, but theirs.